Hello again, doctors, and welcome back to my channel. I apologize for the delay in uploading. I have step two coming up. I have Crohn's disease, so I had some surgery, and yeah. But I am back better than ever, finally wrapping up my series on trematodes, going over the liver and lung flukes for USMLE step one. Let's get right into it. So as always, grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. Now the flukes are in the kingdom metazoa, so they are multicellular parasitic worms. From there, worms are either round or flat, and flukes are in the flatworm phylum or platyhelminth in the class Trematoda. In my intro to parasites video, I introduced the mnemonic BILL to remember the four flukes and the four systems they infect, blood, intestine, liver, and lung. In parts one and two of this series, I detailed the first group, Schistosoma, because they are the most high yield first step. So if you haven't seen those yet, they'll be linked for you below. Today, we will go over the highest yield points to know for the remaining flukes that infect the liver and lung. So let's dive right in, starting with a mnemonic to remember the names of these flukes. The fluke names are going to follow the same order as Bill. So the schistosomes are the blood flukes. The fasciola species and clonorchis sinensis infect the GIT and liver, specifically the biliary system. And P. westermanni is our lung fluke. The mnemonic I used to keep them straight was... Some fashion critics praise West for Kanye and his Jesus line. So the first letters line up with the names. Next up, let's go over what all the flukes have in common with each other. Let's go over their basic structure. Most of them look like this, being obviously flat and sort of this oblong body shape. They have anterior and ventral suckers for both feeding and for attachment. And of course, they have a gut. But the majority of their structure is going to be dedicated to their reproductive organs because all of the flukes we're going over today are hermaphrodites, or diagenetic, meaning they have both male and female reproductive organs, allowing for self-fertilization in the sexual reproductive phase. The only flukes that are not hermaphrodites are the blood flukes, the schistosomes. Now with that in mind, if you're given an image like this in a question stem, which is the same one from first aid, by the way, you can rule out a schistosome, because they look like this. <laughs> and are found in reproductive pairs, so not alone. Now let's go over the basics of the fluke life cycle. First off, they all use a species of freshwater snail as their intermediate host, with no exception. So water or marsh is involved in all of their life cycles. Humans can act as, or are, their definitive hosts, so they undergo sexual reproduction in us, excreting out eggs from various sites where they hatch once they come into fresh water and look for their snail host. Once developed, the snail excretes out forms which mature to become infective to humans and the cycle repeats. For those of you who saw part one, welcome back Trematode Bill. He's gonna to continue to demonstrate for us each fluke's life cycle in humans. As always, blood first, the schistosomes are on the left side alone because their route of entry and infectious form is unique to only them and it's via direct penetration of skin by cercariae. The remaining fluke species for today's video are easily grouped together because they share so many features. First off, they share the same route of entry, which is ingestion. So remember the trick, all the rest we ingest, usually through contaminated water or vegetation. Not only that, they share the same infectious form called metacercariae, either insisted on plants or free living in water. Upon reaching the intestines, the flukes then eat their way through our tissue to reach their final home, for which they are named. So clonorchis sinensis and the fasciolas eat their way to the liver, specifically the biliary tree. And Paragonemus westermanni eats his way to the lung. There they mature into adults and undergo sexual reproduction. And remember, these all are hermaphrodites, so they have both male and female reproductive organs. They have the female UG storing eggs in the ovary near to a seminal receptacle, which receives sperm from the testes, mixing the contents and fertilizing eggs to be passed out of the body. The liver flukes, fasciolas and clonorchis, pass those eggs through stool in bile. The lung fluke, P. westermanni, produces eggs in sputum, which can be either coughed out or swallowed and then passed in feces. And we will review this as we go, so just stay with me. Now let's talk about one final thing these fluke babies all have in common, and that is their egg morphology. So all of their eggs look the same. 
There are buzzwords consistently used to describe eggs of specific parasites in UWorld and consequently on step one. And on this channel, we use those to our advantage. First up is the buzzword unembryonated. And if you see this in a question, that one word can narrow you down from all parasites to worms specifically, because their life cycles are cyclodevelopmental, using eggs and larvae and split into two phases, sexual and asexual with two hosts. Unlike any protozoan species, which do not produce eggs, because they cannot develop or reproduce outside of a host, so they exist in cyst and trophozoite forms. So the word unembryonated is sort of telling you, okay, this parasite develops outside its host and uses eggs, worms. Next up is one of my favorite buzzwords, the word operculated, Latin for having a lid. Now, if you see this word used to describe eggs in a question, it is specifically pointing you to one of four parasite species, three of which are the flukes in this video, and lastly, a cestode, the fish tapeworm Diphelobothrium latum, and all of their eggs are indistinguishable from one another. So let's recap. Get it? Recap? <laughs> okay. So the species which produce operculated eggs are the flukes, the fasciolas, clenorches, and P. West, and the cestode diphyllo, the fish tapeworm. So if you see this on test day, it is one of these four guys, and you can use the epidemiology, symptom profile, or the lab results to further narrow it down to your answer. Now that we've gone over what all the flukes have in common, we're going to dive into the species-specific details, going in order from most to least high yield, and also following Bill's name. First up are the liver flukes, starting with the fasciola species, which is the fashion part of our mnemonic for names. The fasciolas are also known as the common sheep liver fluke, so a handy way to remember this is fasciola. And the reason she's called this is simple. We've gone over the general life cycle for trematodes as a whole, and we can and do act as definitive hosts for all of them. In the case of the fasciolas, other mammals like pigs, cattle, or sheep are the typical definitive hosts. So it's usually sheep ingesting contaminated vegetation or water and propagating the fasciolas life cycle. However, we can of course act as that definitive host if we ingest said contaminated vegetation or water. Now, this does not mean that we are incidental or dead-end hosts. That concept is entirely separate, and it only refers to cases where we cannot propagate said parasite's life cycle, acting as a literal dead-end. The most famous example of this is Lyme's disease with Borrelia burgdorferi. For the trematodes as a whole, even if we aren't their typical hosts, it just so happens that we are mammals and we're able to ingest the infectious form and we do propagate the life cycle. Okay, so now that we've got that straight, there are technically two species of fasciola, Gigantum and Hepatica, but Hepatica is the most commonly tested and it's easily remembered because it's the liver fluke. In terms of the epidemiology, fasciola is a fashionista, world traveler, and is one of the most prevalent human fluke infections worldwide. Just keep in mind that the snail intermediate host and the passage of eggs in stool sort of constrains the prevalence to areas that are warm and underdeveloped. For their cycle in humans, like all trematodes in this video, infection occurs upon ingestion of the metasaccharii, in this case, in contaminated water or on watery vegetation, like water crust. After this, they wind up in the duodenum, where they then literally eat their way through the tissue in route to the liver, specifically the biliary tree. There they feed on bile and mature into adults, and then undergo sexual reproduction with themselves, and excrete out unembryonated eggs through stool in bile. And now on to fasciolaesis. So how will a patient present in a question on this fluke? Well, first off, we have the acute phase, which can occur anywhere from days to months post-ingestion, and that would depend on how much of the parasite they ingest. This presentation is due to the actual destruction of tissue by the baby flukes eating their way from the duodenum to the bile ducts and gallbladder. And you get a profile like this. High fever, rash, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hepatosplenomegaly, ascites, and cough and hemoptysis. Now you will actually see lists of symptoms like this a lot on step that are seemingly nondescript and you read them like 
You've got GI symptoms, a rash, cough, the liver pathology. I call it the rainbow. But you can and should pick out those signs that are most relevant. In this case, that high fever and rash, which are pro-inflammatory, pointing you towards an infectious or allergic cause. That being said, almost all pathogens have acute phases with profiles that look something like this. So let's keep going to see what sets the fasciolos apart. If the acute stage is not treated, patients are at risk of developing the chronic disease. It can always course through periods of latency where patients are asymptomatic, possibly being detected upon familial screening. But we're unlikely to be tested on that because fluke infections do become symptomatic at some point. The flukes firmly attach themselves to the lining of the biliary tree, causing bleeding, inflammation, and ultimately epithelial hyperplasia. Clinically, the major symptom to remember is abdominal pain, specifically right upper quadrant that worsens on inhalation or a positive Murphy sign. This presentation coupled with puritis or itching and steatorrhea or fatty stool is indistinguishable from cholangitis, cholecystitis, and cholithiasis, so gallbladder pathologies. Once the flu starts to lay eggs, they can build up within the narrow bile ductules, blocking the passage of bile. Not only that, the flukes themselves grow to a large size. This is a gross image of a goat liver, and you can see how huge they are. So as you can imagine, one way or the other, they cause obstruction to the flow of bile, which in and of itself will cause this symptom profile. The problem is amplified, though, because they're not only blocking the flow of bile, they're eating it, depleting our reserves, leading to the profound steatorrhea and puritis. So with this in mind, keep the liver flukes on your list of differentials for gallbladder pathologies, especially if the person has a history of travel or immigration. Okay, and for the treatment of fasciolaesis, now if you saw my schistosoma video, you know that for the flukes and some other worms, we use praziquanto, an anti-helminthic whose mechanism is unknown. So go crazy for prazy because we don't need to know how it works and it's drug of choice for all fluke infections except the fasciolas. For whatever reason, praziquanto is ineffective in the treatment of fasciolaesis. She must have some inherent resistance to the drug. So for this fashionista, she won't wear just anything and you can't use just anything to treat it. So to find the right outfit, she must try clothes on. And for fasciolaesis, the drug of choice is triclub benbazole. Sounds like a stretch, but I did use this to remember. The fashionista tries clothes on, maybe in a Benz. Try Club Ben Diesel. It works at the level of microtubules, inhibiting tubulin. And this is the major point to remember for the fasciolas is the special treatment. All right, and now on to the second and last liver fluke, Clonorchis sinensis, the Chinese liver fluke. Named as such because he is the most prevalent parasitic infection in China. So I nicknamed him Clonor Chinesis. The route of entry is, of course, via ingestion of metasticariae. This time they are ingested within the meat of fish that is consumed either raw or undercooked, like in sushi. This is a little bit different than the fasciolas, whose metasticariae were found on plants or in water. And this is because the life cycle of Clonorchis has an extra step. We still act as the definitive host, no exception there, excreting eggs through stool and bile. This time though, they are embryonated eggs, which hatch in fresh water, infect their snail intermediate host, who then excrete out forms which go on to infect fish, which will carry the metasicariae and cyst it in their meat until improperly consumed by a human. Everything else remains the exact same. The baby flukes find their way to the biliary tree, mature to adults, and lay eggs through stool and bile. So don't get confused by these crazy life cycles. We are not parasitologists, we are doctors, and we don't need to fuss about the specifics. So remember infective and diagnostic. And now on to the clinical presentation. For the acute and invasive phase, it can occur anywhere from days to months post-ingestion, and it depends on how much the patient ingests. Again, it is due to the actual mechanical destruction of tissue from the baby flukes eating their way from the duodenum to the biliary tree, and you get a symptom profile like this. 
Yes, indistinguishable from other parasitic or infectious causes. So let's continue on to see what sets clown arches apart. If left untreated, of course, the latent or chronic disease will ensue, ranging from being asymptomatic to this obstructive profile. With epigastric pain, specifically right upper quadrant, that worsens on inhalation. Coupled with steatorrhea and puritis, and we have the exact same chronic profile as fasciolasis, which makes sense. This is a liver fluke infecting the same biliary system as the fasciolas. So what's the one thing that we should remember about Clenarchus? Well, he has a complication, and that is the risk of developing cholangiocarcinoma, or cancer of the gallbladder. The incidence of cholangiocarcinoma associated with fluke infections is of major concern in Asia, and STEP absolutely loves neglected tropical diseases, and for good reason. So a question on clonorchus sinensis will most likely involve a patient with a profoundly obstructive hepatic profile with high bilirubin, ALP, and GTT. And diagnosis would be on ELISA or on OMP, appreciating embryonated, operculated eggs in stool. Okay, doctor, now we are done going over the liver flukes as well as going over how they all infect the GIT. Moving on to our final system, the lung and the lung fluke, Paragonemus westermani, or P. West, from our mnemonic for names. For the epidemiology, he is mainly found in Eastern Asia, specifically in Japan. And the route of entry, like always, is ingestion of cysts containing metasuccariae, this time insisted in the meat of crabs. So consuming raw crab meat is a risk for this disease. And that's because, like Clown Orchis, P. West has that extra step in his life cycle, with two intermediate hosts, the snail and the crab. So the meat of an infected crab will contain the metasuccariae of P. West, releasing them upon ingestion within the duodenum. From the duodenum, they of course then eat their way to their final destination, the parenchyma of the lung. And there they do something pretty incredible. They trigger granuloma formation to their advantage, so they actually live inside of the granulomas, slowly maturing into adults and then producing eggs to be eventually excreted out into the alveolar space and then coughed out through sputum. So the main route of exit for the eggs of P. West is through sputum. Therefore, this is the route that we will be tested on diagnostically is to find the eggs of P. West in sputum sample or on bronchoalveolar lavage. However, there is some literature that suggests that the eggs can be swallowed and then subsequently passed through stool, and I will leave that link for you down below. In terms of clinical presentation, the acute and invasive phase, as always, is due to the mechanical destruction from the juvenile flukes migrating from the duodenum to the parenchyma of the lung, presenting with high fever and rash, as well as abdominal pain. However, what sets this disease apart from the rest is the lack of liver involvement because P. West is the only fluke to not use the liver at all. So you will have normal LFTs and no hepatosplenomegaly or ascites. The final symptoms of cough and hemoptysis are the most common presentation for acute paragonomiasis, and that is true hemoptysis, with the blood coming from the destructive migration of the flukes to the lung. As always, if left untreated, the chronic course will ensue, and this is what we're most likely to be tested on. It presents with cough and sputum that is intermittently brown. Now, it's important to distinguish this brown sputum from hemoptysis in the acute phase, which was from actual blood. This brown sputum is not from blood. It's due to the eggs of P. West being excreted out in such large numbers into the sputum that it gives it a brown tinge. So when you have a chronic productive cough combined with progressive dyspnea on exertion and loss of stamina, chronic paragonomiasis is often confused with TB making it an excellent test question. So your differential here should be tuberculosis, but we're lacking fever in the chronic course, as well as night sweats and adventitious breath sounds. And confirmation, of course, would be on pathology. So it's important to keep P. West on your list of differentials for pathogens that mimic TB. The other major one being the fungus histoplasma, and I will link my video on that below. All right, and that is it for the information portion of this video. I did make a review sheet for you guys. This is what it looks like. So if you wanna stick around, I'm just gonna quickly run through how I set it up. 
Bill, blood, intestine, liver, lung. Some fashion critics praise West. Shostasoma, Fasciola, Clonorchis, and P. West. Blood first, Shistosoma, Man Ham Japan, Mansoni, Hematobium, and Jabonicum, running from left to right or west to east with their epi. The infectious form is Cercariae, found free living in contaminated fresh water and enter via direct penetration of skin. They migrate to the veins of the liver, where they mature into adults, male and female, and then pair. Once paired, they migrate to the veins of their future homes to lay eggs, which we use diagnostically to determine what species a patient is infected with. Mansoni on the left with a lateral spine, hematobium in the center with a central spine, and round japonicum on the right. Mansoni migrates to the mesenteric veins of the GIT, M&M, &M, and his eggs are found in stool. Hematobium, the one with a B in its name, migrates to the bladder, and its eggs are found in urine. Japonicum is found in either site and in either sample. Lastly, always remember, Schistosoma hematobium has an increased risk for carcinoma of the bladder. All the rest we ingest, the metasecariae. From left to right, fasciola first, the metasecariae is either in water or on plants. Upon ingestion, they eat their way to the biliary tree, where they grow into adults and lay eggs, which are passed via bile in stool. Fast sheep ola is this sheep liver fluke, the fashionista, world traveler found worldwide, and she tries clothes on. We use triclobendazole. For clenor chinesis, infection occurs upon ingestion of cysts with metacercariae found in the meat of fish. Upon ingestion, they eat their way to the biliary tree where they mature into adults. Passing eggs through stool in bile. And the eggs of Clonorchis are the only ones that are embryonated. And he is the second fluke with the risk of carcinoma, this time to the gallbladder with cholangiocarcinoma. And finally, the lung fluke. Infection is upon ingestion of the metasocariae within the meat of raw crab. From the duodenum, they eat their way to the lung, where they mature into adults inside of granulomas and excrete out eggs into sputum to be coughed out of the body. And P. West is the only fluke to not involve a liver, so we will have normal liver function tests. And this final black box goes across all of these eggs because don't forget, they are operculated eggs on OMP. Oof, okay, that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you stay tuned to my channel. It will not be such a long wait for my next video. Good luck studying, everyone. I, of course, will see you on the next one.